Thanks for tuning in to today's podcast. Please remember that all of the information in this podcast episode is limited to general information only. That means the information is not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So you should seek the advice of a licensed and trusted financial professional before acting on the information. And before you acquire or apply for a financial product, please read the PDS or product disclosure statement, which should be available on the issuer's website. Lastly, please keep in mind that past performance is not indicative of future performance. After a volatile and busy year for investors, the final few episodes in the Investors Podcast series are going to be a bit more relaxed and laid back. This episode features Kanish Chug of ETF Securities. We discuss three of his firm's most popular ETFs, including the Fang Plus ETF, the Tech ETF, and the Gold ETF. Kanish also finds some counterpoints to my concerns around holding gold in a portfolio and provides some examples of ways that it can be used. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast. Kanish, thanks for taking the time out to join me on the podcast, mate. Mate, no, thanks for having me on. Uh, for those who don't know, we've spoken before on the Australian Finance Podcast, which is our beginner slash intermediate show. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes to that. But Mate, why don't I just throw it over to you to give a bit of an intro to what you do at ETF Securities. Um, I know your role has kind of expanded recently, so I'll let you fill in the blanks. Yeah, sure. So um, so my role at ETF Securities is as head of distribution. So it's basically covering the sales and marketing, you know, supporting and promoting um, the funds that ETF Securities has. Mm-hmm. For a lot of people that may not be aware, you know, ETF Securities has been around since 2003 where what I would look at as say is we're one of the more innovative um, ETF providers within the Australian landscape. We launched the world's first physical gold ETF. We were looking to basically what we call is the intelligent alternative um, mm. and you know try to either find gaps in the market from an ETF perspective to bring investors choice um, or pos- potentially even looking to do things better. So. Mm. You know, examples have been our most recent ETFs this year. We launched a FANG ETF, et cetera. So that's where we sit. And um, from our perspective, you know, the ETF market's growing. Um, new investors are coming to the market in 2020. So it's, it's been a big shift, I think, in the investor landscape. Mm. When I looked at the latest farm numbers across the business, I was kind of taken back. I didn't realize um, how big the business had grown. What's it been like for you being on the inside growing from such a, like a kind of like a startup. I know you've been around for quite a while, but kind of like a startup in terms of personnel to now being a really established player. Well, I think that's been a, a really big shift for, you know, I've been part of the business now for six years mm. and we have had a the gold product, GOLD, for since 2003, but that's been our mainstay. And a lot of people know the product, weren't aware of ETF securities. And for a long time, we were essentially looking at mainly commodities and we do have the physical metals and silver, platinum, palladium and gold, but there's more to us than that. And in the past five years, we've really worked hard on that. So looking to broaden out into equities, increase our awareness to investors as well. What, what I find with ETFs is over the past five, six years, you've seen many new products launched. You know, we now have nearly 212, 215 passive ETFs available for investors in the Australian market. What they don't understand yet is that there's a lot of potential similarities by name, but a lot of differences when you actually open up the bonnet and look underneath. So a lot of work that we like to do is we like to be seen as an ETF consultant for investors, both financial professionals, institutional, and mum and dad retail investors as well. We wanna make sure they're aware of the differences across the ETF market It could be fees, it could be exposure, it could be one is hedged, one is unhedged, you know, whatever it may be, that is our job. And that's what we've worked really hard on in the past few years um, to one, grow the team out, grow the product range out, but also educate investors. Mm, For sure. I've noticed that push from you guys uh, most recently. Um, In 2020, obviously the big uh, theme for everyone has kind of been obviously COVID, but the implications for investors has been that, you know, we're brought forward the adoption curve effectively. So companies that early adopters or, um, you know, early stage enterprising investors, VCs, et cetera, were already looking at have now been moved, you know, forefront into the limelight. And um, from your perspective, um, the first ETF that we're looking at, which is the FANG Plus ETF, um, from your perspective, has that probably been one of the most successful from your range? It's been one of the most successful launches we've ever had. 
Um, so to give you some context, we, the assets under, under management, you know, we launched in basically the first week of March as, you know, <laughs> probably one of the lowest points in the market. Uh, we're now at about 170 million, I believe, um, under management. And that obviously can move day to day, but, you know, for us from, you know, what is nine months, mm -hmm. uh, 10 months, um, you know, it's been an amazing journey i think it was right timing for that product and you know you can never pick the timing but that, that's been the case for, mm -hmm. for that investors an ability to take advantage of the market rally and what we also found is we wanted to launch that fund for a number of reasons you know it gives exposure for those that aren't aware so the fang etf fang is the code it tracks the new york stock exchange fang plus index now as the name suggests, it gives exposure to the FANG stock. So they're very straightforward. It's Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. You know, you're five. But the FANG Plus, it is, the plus is important because it beyond goes beyond those FANG names. So it looks at Tesla, Baidu, Alibaba. It looks at um, Twitter, NVIDIA. So these are names that, you know, are on that cusp of being innovative, quality, mega cap names. And for a lot of investors, they wanted to know, well, how do I just get exposure to that? You know, you can take broad market exposures, whether it's the S&P 500, whether it's a NASDAQ 100, et cetera, you can take an active manager who will have these bets on as well. But if you want to take a low cost way to just have these exposures, well, the FANG ETF was a perfect place for it. And in a, it, the fee is 35 basis points or 0.35% per annum. Mm -hmm. So that gives you some context. You know, that is your only charge from a, fund perspective obviously there are some transactional costs etc that you would pay but that's why we wanted to bring it out is it's a cheap alternative way and also it's 10 stocks and mm. we talk about the concentration i did some analysis you know if you look at um the nasdaq 100 index the top 10 make up 55 percent of that index so you get concentration even from some of the broad indexes this is obviously a bit more concentrated but what it does is it gives you what are the key drivers of the year-to-date performance this year. You know, I think year-to-date, the FANG ETF or the FANG index returned 75.59%, so nearly close to 76%. Um, wow. The ETF, because we only launched in March, has returned just over 50%. Um, but had we had that from the start of the year, it would have returned 76%. But we obviously, we, we launched it first week of March. Mm. So the concentrated exposure, why did you choose to go with 10 stocks um, over say, you know, yeah, like a broader, a broader suite of products is, has that been, I mean, it seems like it's been re received well by advisors or um, yes. direct investors. Well, there's two reasons. One is it's offering an alternative choice to what many investors already had available to them. So they mm -hmm. could obviously access the S&P 500, that's your 500 by, it's not necessarily just market cap, I think, because Tesla's only just been included and in theory, you would say Tesla should have been included many years ago. Yeah, it's got um, 600 billion um, market cap yep. for Tesla as I look at this now, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there's a few more um, criteria that the S&P 500 had that people aren't aware of. But for a lot of investors, they would say, well, I've got the S&P 500 ETF available to me, or I can take a NASDAQ 100 um, exposure, or I can look at a, an active manager that, as I said, may have tilt towards some of these names. What we found though were investors wanted to be more overweight and concentrated on these specific names. If I looked at that performance on that year to date, as I mentioned, so that FANG index, FANG plus index that we track in Australian dollar terms has returned 76%. Mm. The NASDAQ 100 index in Australian dollar terms year to date, this is to the end of November for, for context, has returned 35.2%. The S&P 500, 8.9%. And the lowly ASX 200, the Australian market, 0.2%. So um, for a lot of investors, what they may say is, well, I, wanted, I want the, the key drivers of, of the rally. I want the key drivers of the performance. And what you actually find is these are the mega cap names. These are now moved beyond just being sort of growth names and startups. And that's what a lot of people get confused about. They see an Apple or they see a Facebook. You look at some of those revenue um, you know, that these companies are earning. Um, mm. Amazon has used COVID, you know, in the best way possible to expand mm. rather than shutting down flights. They're buying more airplanes to be able to deliver more, mm. you know, their revenues from an Amazon subscription revenue is now sitting about 6.6 .6 billion for the third quarter of 2020. Now that's up 
from 1.5 billion in the Q3 2016. So over four years, you're seeing nearly a quadrupling of mm. just revenue from their, just their subscription. So, you know, you find these are moving beyond that. They're what you could call the new 21st century industrials in a lot of ways. They're part and parcel of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, we need these names, you know, that we rely upon them in a lot of ways, not just in ways that we think. You look at um, Amazon with their cloud software and their cloud servicing. Mm. So AWS, um, Amazon Web Services. It's one of the largest cloud servicing sort of uh, subsidiaries or companies around the world. So from that perspective, you generally find that investors wanted this as a core holding or as an enhanced core holding above and beyond just buying a broad 100 stocks or 500 stocks. This is really what they were after. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating ETF because it also has um, the the liquidity uh, filter in the in the security selection. So yes. for people that don't know, there are, you know, obviously there's a market cap filter to get con considered for the portfolio, but then there's the liquidity filter. Why was that brought in? So there's a number of reasons. Obviously with a lot of ETFs, you want essentially to have certain liquidity criteria to ensure that the ETF is can be traded efficiently and investors can buy buy into and sell out of that particular product. So what you will find with a lot of equity ETFs is there's those liquidity filters. These filters are slightly higher benchmarked for this particular index. And the reason being is what the view is, is to look at the growth drivers and the innovative companies and quality names. So that's really what they wanted to try to identify there from that perspective. Mm. We get a lot of questions in terms of the 10 names, you know, why isn't Microsoft in there? And what I would like to say on that, because it's, it's a question we get, and Microsoft's not in there for the main reason being is that it was seen as being a more of a traditional technology company and hadn't had the innovation behind it for a number of years. So, so this index has been around for close to six years now. And these 10 names have been pretty much the stable 10 names in the, mm. in the index. Microsoft has never yet featured in there. It's on the radar of the index committee and they do consider it because they are looking to move into you know other revenue sources outside of just your your traditional hardware you know we know microsoft is doing a lot of work in the cloud servicing um area so there this is what i would say is this could potentially be broader than these 10 names and it could include companies like microsoft you know if we look at what disney's trying to do with their streaming platform so these are uh, these companies are at the leading edge of their particular peer group and that is the important part Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, like I said, it's it's a I guess a, an ETF that's caught the imagination of a lot of investors, and for the ease of use to get that exposure. Um, but given that it's got ten names in it, would you say it's better suited to a tactical or a core position for people? I would say depending on your risk profile. So very much for those investors that are have a long-term view that are very much on that growth tilt, you would all, you could even say it is, and even at the balance perspective, if they've, depending upon your risk profile, you could sit it in there as a core um, within your portfolio. Mm -hmm. But you may want to use it tactically, depending upon how you're constructing your portfolio. If you're looking at saying, I have the S&P 500, but I want to overweight into these growth companies and these growth industries and what and these mega trends essentially so we, we talk about mega trends in, in, a, in the sense of you're investing for the future and what the future will hold these 10 companies capture all main mega trends from artificial intelligence electric vehicles robotics cloud computing e-commerce so these 10 names in one quick way gives you the complete mega trend. So that's why I'd say, depending on the investor, we have seen financial professionals use it as a core holding for growth investors. We have seen financial professionals and, and, and retail investors use it as a tactical as well to go overweight. Because obviously, as I said, you know, the weights, if you were to just take a broad index, may not be there for some of these names. So the next ETF, can you share we want to talk about is the gold ETF um, yes. and it's your largest ETF by assets under management. You, you, you emailed me cause you know, I have quite strong views on gold <laughs> <laughs> and you emailed me a few, few weeks ago and you said, how about we talk about this? And um, I was like, Oh, maybe that's better over a beer than over a podcast. But we figured 
I was chatting to Nicola and she says, yeah, why not do it? It's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a fun topic. So there, this is a very polarizing thing, right? And I'm going to just add at the outset here that the gold ETF, GOLD, um, has been in our subscription services. It actually has been um, the preferred gold exposure for quite a while now, and it still is. And um, that's just because, you know, there are many features about it, which I'm sure you'll get to. But um, so I want to I wanted to make that clear at the outset that if, I was going towards a gold allocation. This is my preferred exposure. So I want to be clear about that. <laughs> now, I'm going to play devil's advocate here and I'm going to throw some questions at you. And then I'm sure you get these all the time. So you'll be able to field them pretty easily. And then um, we'll, just, we'll just go from there. So um, I'll start with one that not necessarily is something that I cling to, but a lot of investors here in Australia think about, which is the income or the absence of income for, for a gold product. You know, we have franking credits, dividend yields off the charts here in Australia. What is your counterpoint to people who say that there's no yield, yield on gold? So I think you know, from, from the outset as well, the questions that you've raised and the concerns that you, you've raised and that you and I spoke about on email, I think they're valid in the sense that these are questions we get on a regular basis from investors. So they, we, need, we want to address it. You know, we see ourselves as one of the, the experts in the gold field, given we launched the world's first gold ETF. With the aspect of yield, what you find is, yes, it is 100% true, a physical gold ETF will not give you any income. What we are trying to do is we're trying to give you a pure exposure to the movement of the price of gold, unhedged as well. So we have 26 tonnes, I worked it out the other day, um, currently of gold that sits in a vault allocated to the fund, allocated to investors. It's very safe. It can be redeemed for the metal. It gathers dust. There is no income attached to it. A lot of Australian investors, I would say prior to probably 2019, um, because we did see a bit of a move, were questioning, why would I ever look at gold? It doesn't give me any income. I prefer to buy a bond ETF or, a fi- or, or some form of fixed income exposure. I prefer to buy... Uh, a dividend stock that pays pays me an income. Gold has a unique place in a portfolio as a defensive alternative. So that's where the key point there is. What you found was as fixed income and equities, the correlation between both started to be go in sync with each other. So as equity markets starts to move, you saw essentially fixed income move in a similar way. Yield started to come down. You saw you know a lot of easing from central banks. You know, so there is no real place for investors to say, well, where can I get my income from? The traditional place would have been bonds. That wasn't the case, you know, with yields coming down and real yields even more so. So as basically, if you had a bond that pays you 1% over one year and say you invested $1,000 or $100, for example, you know, that 1%, you get a dollar at the end of the year. Now, if inflation moves also, that $1 is worth less than 1%. So the real yield is actually less than what the actual yield is. So what you found is as real yields were rising, you saw basically investors going, well, interest rates are coming down, inflation's going up, what can I do? I, I need to park my money somewhere. So there's an opportunity cost that we find with investors. And that is if interest rates are low, and they have been this year considerably low and they're low for long is what the perception is. Well, I'm not gonna be looking at fixed income. Now I could go down the path and say, well, let me just pile into equities. There's a risk involved in that. We've seen that this year with the volatility that's occurred. We've seen that this year with a number of dividend stocks not paying a dividend. So what can I do? I don't, I can't sit it in cash. Cash is not paying me much anyway. So I need to put my money somewhere. And what you found is, Gold was a great source as a defensive hedge to inflation, but also to the equity market volatility. So there is never a perfect hedge to inflation, but gold has done a very stable job and historically has done that. So that's why we saw investors looking at gold, even though it doesn't pay an income. And what we found this year was, and last year as well, as people started to see volatility in the markets, they sort of were considering, well, I need to be a bit defensive. I want to diversify. We, we always talk about that idea of diversification. You know, one of my, one of my um, colleagues uh, the other day said, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. So it's a proverb that we use all the time. And that's what it is. We don't want to essentially have all our eggs in one basket. 
we don't want everything to be in equities because if that's the case, there's a risk that we may, our portfolios may lose um, from that perspective. So you want to have diversification and gold gives you an uncorrelated asset and therefore provides you diversification. Yeah, the, the defensive piece has been the most puzzling for me and for our team recently. Like if du- duration on most bond funds is off the charts, so you can step sideways or a little bit further up the risk curve to maybe something more like hybrids or something of that nature, but it, the complexity also goes up with that and there's also more risk in that. Um, what about then, you know, this is something that uh, kind of Buffett talks about a lot um, and even uh, Jack Bogle um, you know, they say that there's no intrinsic value of gold. You can't value it. You base the valuation of you know stocks on dividend yields or earnings yields, bonds on coupons. How do you, how do you respond to that? So there are a number of drivers of gold price. Um, there, there was a there's a one of the best quotes I've seen, and I want to I want to get say it exactly as it is. Is the best way to think of gold is as a non yielding currency with a special trait. The only way to print it is to pull it out of the earth at a great cost. Um, and that's what it is, is there's a finite supply. So when you think about the movement of gold, there are certain drivers in that. You're talking about the supply and demand aspect, and that comes in from the real yield and the inflation argument, the move from an investment perspective. So ETFs investments has had an impact on the gold price as you've started to see more investors come into it. And that's been more of a modern trait than it has been historically because that access to gold as an investment tool has really been opened up in the past 15, 16 years since we launched that gold ETF. You've seen the mining supply. You've seen also the impact that the US dollar will have as well. So you have a number of different drivers of the gold price. These all input into a wider model. What I would say to investors is gold should never be a 20%, 30%, unless you're very, very buried and you're a bit of a gold bug in your portfolio. What we have generally seen this year is definitely people have been overweight gold within their portfolios because they've taken it as a tactical tilt, given what's happened in markets, given what's happening with central banks and monetary policy. So what we have seen this year is they've used it in that tactical way. What we're now starting to see is investors at the most highest professional sense start to move it from a tactical allocation to a strategic allocation. They've understood its place in a portfolio. It's your insurance in your portfolio. And that's really the key point there. So when you, you're talking to those, um, like say they're large investors, family officers, high net worths, um, institutions, et cetera, what type of allocations are they putting in their, their uh, strategic asset allocations? Like you mentioned 20% there is kind of, you know, something that maybe it would be a, for someone that's very bearish, but how about for these large institutional investors? What are they looking at? What we're generally seeing is between two and a half to five percent. Yeah, in right. Portfolio. Yeah. Okay. So the whole idea of 60 40, you know, we, we I think the 60 40 portfolio may not, it's not dead, but it needs to be rethought because the idea is that I'm just going to take 40% of parking into cash and fixed income. Well, that's no, that can't be the case. You need to have that alternative pool in there. And that's where we see gold sit. So gold can be in there within that alternative pool. I've seen you know, some professional investors have it as much as 10 to 15% in their portfolios. Um, Again, tactical positioning based on their views of what they're seeing in the markets and where they see gold moving. We see a lot of, I guess, you know, projections on the gold price. And we've had this sort of plateauing out of the price at the moment. It's sitting at about that 18, 1850 US dollar mark right now. One key point there is it is, an allocation within your portfolio, but it's a complement to the rest of your portfolio. One of our, our chairman, Graham Tuckle, who obviously originated um, and created the, the structure of GLD, he once said, you essentially want gold to not do anything for your portfolio. You don't want it to, to be positive or negative. In a lot of ways, it's it potentially, if it, if it is negative, then that's a positive for your entire portfolio because you have the rest of your portfolio doing well, which is why I say, what we are seeing is that as a strategic allocation, it's between two to 5%. If you're much more defensive, you can go up to 10%, but what that's sort of the, the sweet spot is probably that 5% level. Um, as I said, it's a complement to your other defensive tools. You mentioned going further up the risk curve in terms of hybrids, et cetera. And yes, there's complexity to those, but that's what you do see. If people are wanting yield and wanting to go to a high yield 
bond strategies or active managers or hybrids you're looking further down the risk up the risk curve in terms of equities um, again so for those that are wanting that income it's a complement to those strategies and as an uncorrelated asset and historically it has been uncorrelated to treasuries it's been uncorrelated to equity markets it's a good place to be and having a small allocation it's your insurance yeah it's funny because as i said that that it's very challenging on the defensive side it's not just you know um, private investors who think about that it, there are so many challenges from a large institutional um, perspective as well how about then you know it, 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 i'm imagining a retiree or pr- near retiree someone you know um, late 50s early 60s thinking um, i'm worried you know i want to keep my purchasing power this opportunity cost in the next one to three years do you see the gold play is kind of that seek uh, minimizing that sequencing risk so that you know jumping across in that transition to retirement period is that i'd imagine from a financial planning background that's where i would be thinking there's quite eff- quite a bit of efficacy in something like this well what i do see is as i said if it's an ability to bring down the volatility in returns in your portfolio that's a positive to me so if you're smoothing out that volatility that is what gold is designed to do historically and that's what you want it to do now it's not going to be a large part of your allocation especially if you're looking at it from an etf perspective very liquid for an investor to say well i now want to go underweight my five percent to two and a half percent and i want to cash out i want to liquidate that holding and i want to reallocate that to another part of, the, of, of their portfolio, they can easily do that. So for, for us, that's what we would generally want to see. We also get this question and we, we didn't, we haven't sort of discussed it before, but we get this question of why not just go gold miners? You know, I know I'm going to get that same exposure to gold, the gold price. And yes and no. What you generally find is you're buying a gold miner for that growth or growth aspect of it. You're buying it for the mining, the equity exposure very different characteristics to a physical gold exposure. So the characteristics are two completely different things. You, in theory, could have both because a gold mining stock has other inputs that you know, drive its price. It's the, the operation of the mine. You know, uh, do, they, do they actually have, do they hit any um, setbacks, for example, the management of the company? There are many other aspects outside of the gold price that will drive up and down the gold mining stocks, and they're generally going to be also more volatile. Again, so if you're using gold as a defensive tool, a gold mining stock is not that. And so that's the key point there is it is an asset class on its own. It's an investment exposure on its own. It shouldn't be compared. It's like comparing apples to oranges. You can't do that. You know, it is standalone. It's 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 been quite a, a important distinction to make this year because obviously Warren Buffett, who so many investors follow, bought bought shares in a gold miner and then people misconstrued that to think he's investing in gold, which is a different thing, as you mentioned. Uh, um, Okay, then. So how about then when people come to you and they say, you know, what about when we didn't talk about this off air in that email exchange, but how about if they say, you know, well, what about things like crypto assets or unlisted assets? Do you ever get that like people alternative defensive? Are they thinking that as well? Yeah, so we're starting to see a lot more interest in Bitcoin. Bitcoin's had a really good rally this year. Um, I think it's near hit records, highs. And, you know, I saw the Winklevoss twins who obviously are big Bitcoin bulls talking about, you know, Bitcoin hitting 50,000, you know, from I think I think it might be about 15 or 20,000 per Bitcoin in US dollar terms at the moment. What I would say to people that are looking at Bitcoin versus gold, again, different characteristics of what you're looking for. Gold is a safe haven play. It is one of, as I said, it's not the perfect hedge, but it's one of the best ways to hedge against tail risk and inflation. So for those investors saying, well, I'm going to take Bitcoin, Bitcoin has a speculative nature to it. it there's still a bit of a few questions around Bitcoin, and I'm not an expert in, the, in that particular cryptocurrency space myself, so probably w- w- want to say that. But you're looking at using Bitcoin as a defensive safe haven play. Well, that's, it's not that. It is a speculative play, and there may be a place in your portfolio for that. But gold, as I said, is a defensive alternative allocation within your portfolio. Mm. I think the thing for most uh, people that um, think about Bitcoin versus gold is that it just doesn't have the um, the track record yet. I'm just looking at the latest price as we record this around 19,000 US dollars for Bitcoin. So yeah, indeed, it's actually near its 
all time high. I didn't know that. So there you yeah. go. <laughs> um, okay. So we've talked about some of the, the big characteristics of gold. Obviously, um, it's been pretty impressive in terms of an ETF for your business. I, I, would I be correct in saying it had about $800 million of flows this year? So into the fund? That's correct. Yeah. So we've had nearly 800 million of flow um, with the price move as well. So year to date, gold price in Australian dollar terms has moved by about 10%. And what we've seen there is now the, the gold ETF that we have has hit records in terms of its its size. So it's over $2 billion. It took us about 15 years to get to 1 billion and about 18 months to get to 2 billion. So um, a very quick jump in that space. Wow, that's uh, it's funny how things move and, and compound like that. Okay, so let's step away from gold then. Um, let's t- have a look at another ETF. And this is, we're currently constructing, we're revamping our model portfolios on the ETF front. And one of the ETFs that we've looked at is the tech ETF, T-E-C-H, uh, pretty intuitive ticker code. A uh, bit, bit different to FANG. And um, I think there's something unique about this, which people miss. Um, so I'm quite happy to just throw it over to you and explain that distinction uh, between it and most other, I guess, generic technology ETFs. So uh, we were just off air before we started recording this, I was talking to you around the fact that, you know, was at a barbecue on the weekend, speaking to some friends and they were saying, I want to get exposure to tech. And my next question normally is, one, I'm not a financial planner, so probably need to say that. But then my second question was, what do you mean by tech? Do you mean FANG or do you mean tech? technology stocks, because there is a clear distinction. So we talked about our FANG ETF earlier, which Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google, Tesla, Twitter, et cetera. Majority of those names actually are in that index are not technology names. There are only two that would classify as technology sector companies, and that's Apple and Nvidia. Reason being is Facebook, Google are seen as media and communication stocks. Now, why is that? It's based on the revenue and where they generate revenue. And for those two companies, for example, they generate revenue from ads. And so what happened about two, three years ago was S&P and a number of the, it's called a GIX sector classification. It's probably the one of the most widely used sector classifications and each particular index manager has their own view on, on sector classification, et cetera, but they're all fairly in line with each other. They rethought how sectors needed to be defined because there's obviously big moves in companies and how they're generating revenue. And just as the world has moved on, there needs to be that reclassification. So previously a Facebook was a technology name, a Google was a technology name, but they very quickly worked out that if they're generating revenue, majority of their revenue from ads, they can't be a technology name. So they redefined in sector, which is media and communication. So that's where they sit and Amazon, still generates most of its revenue from people buying goods and so goods on their platform. So they're not a, they're a website, but essentially they're a consumer discretionary stock. So again, it's a consumer stock. It's not a technology play. Now that may change as Amazon's cloud services picks up and becomes a majority part of its revenue. But at this point, still, it's a consumer name. A Tesla, another example, that's not a, technology name, even though they're quite innovative in the technology that they're producing, but they are an automobile company. So for us, when we talk to investors, we say, if you want technology, you can get pure sector play. And that is what the tech ETF provides. And that's the code is T-E-C-H. And it looks at global developed markets, technology sector from Morningstar's index family. So it uses the Morningstar's methodology of their moat methodology, which really is really neat. But What it is, is it's 31 names at the moment. It can be anywhere from 25 to 50 names. It's got a range, but it's 31 stocks at the moment. And all these companies are pure technology sector names. So companies in there like Salesforce or Microsoft or Adobe, and I've got a few others, but they cover the hardware and the software side of technology. Mm. It's funny that you bring up Tesla because we were talking off air about this. Um, It's still cut. Uh, categorizes automobile companies and one of the big concerns that people had um, and still have is that it you know the addressable market for electronic vehicles or electric vehicles sorry and uh you know the the price point it's you know it's not it doesn't make sense but it, it kind of goes beyond that but that's another story for next time maybe we'll, we'll we'll come up to that when we get to a different etf um so how about then one of the questions that i get and this is more on like the philosophy of investing is how does morningstar define a moat 
and then how does tech allocate to that? Sure. So what Morningstar's Moat methodology, it's, it's very well known, but Moat essentially looks at a competitive advantage of a stock to its peer group. So they have three ratings of Moat, and that is a wide Moat, a narrow Moat, and a no Moat. Now, a wide moat identifies a stock that has 20 years plus competitive advantage looking forward by, by the way, so 20 years looking forward competitive advantage amongst its peer group. A narrow moat is 10 to 20 years and a zero moat or no moat is zero to 10 years. There are five sources that they've identified of economic moat. So they're things like intangible assets. So an intangible asset is things like, you know, your brand identity, intellectual property, licenses, et cetera, things that will keep a competitor at bay your network effect and that's really important because the value of a good and service increases as more consumers use that good and service now apple is currently not in this particular etf because of its valuation screen that this index has and I'll, we can touch on that in a minute but it was previously and the reason why it was was because apple is seen as having the network effect so you buy an apple phone you're more likely to buy the apple watch the ipad etc samsung is the Android platform. What that means is you don't necessarily need a Samsung device. You can buy HTC, et cetera. So that is a key point there, the network effect. Another driver of the moat ratings or the you know, sources is your switching costs. So that comes from you know, keeping customers from switching from one product to another. So that's all about you know, the training and the implementation costs. So you know, having a high barrier for a consumer to switch from that product or service. And then your last two are things like your cost advantage and your efficient scale. So again, undercutting competition, enhancing profitability. So they're your five sources. And what Morningstar does is they have a team of research analysts around the world. You know, just looking at technology sector, there's analysts based in the US and Europe and Australia that are technology analysts, research analysts. So this is something that as an ETF, we're very lucky that we can license an index from a company that essentially has this this sort of dual identity of being what could be seen as an active strategy because it's using fundamental research in defining a universe. And so that's what Morningstar do. Using their analysts, they define one, what is classified as technology sector. So we talked about how Facebook's not in there, et cetera. So they've got an identification of just companies that are classified within the technology sector. Within that, they research those companies and they apply a moat rating to them. And with this ETF, you are the company either has to have a narrow or a wide moat rating to even be considered for this particular index. So it has to be in that space. So a company like a Microsoft is seen as having a wide moat. You know, it's got the network effect. It's got the intangible asset. You know, it's got the efficient scale. It's got the, you know, it probably ticks a number of these boxes. And the reason being is also from a perspective of, valuation there is a valuation screen within this index as well which is why apple's not in there at the moment mm. it's an interesting one because um i think people are so familiar with morningstar's methodology and the five buckets and then how they kind of um define those based on returns on invested capital versus the cost of capital um it's one that we consider a lot here and um our approach is a little bit different insofar as we give companies effectively a quality score and depending on the quality score it depends where they're you know how how much conviction we have in them and how uh, wide we believe their motor competitive advantage to be and then that informs our cost of capital and our research so it's a it's a really interesting one and i think um the 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 tech etf kind of drills into that and provides exposure to like you said you're effectively crowdsourcing um from qualified equity analysts um how about then the valuation component? Um, how does it? How does the the filter apply? Because we've got two sub portfolios within the one portfolio, and then yes. they're rebalanced every six months. Yes, um, that's right. Do do most companies fall out because of the the valuation? Uh, so a combination. Yes. So you see a number of companies like an Apple will fall out because of that valuation screen. So essentially, it has to be at that fair value that Morningstar has. So again, utilizing that Morningstar's research, they have a fair value um, price it essentially has to be within that range. What you see is you see companies falling out because of that fair value screen. We have companies falling out because of the moat rating or the moat methodology as well. We also have companies not necessarily from a liquidity aspect. So there is a liquidity screen as well, a liquidity cap. We generally have companies not really 
falling out because of that. We also have a country cap as well. Now, whenever you think of technology, you think US. And that's why whenever people say, I'm going to buy a technology index, I'm going to buy the NASDAQ 100, which is just US listed names. It is goes beyond the US. Now, not to say that this tech ETF is predominantly US focused, you know, has nearly 80, 85% exposure to US stocks, but we have the ability to go beyond that. And that's really important. So we have names currently in there from Japan, from South Korea, from Europe. We've had Australian names in there like realestate.com or car sales or zero has featured in this particular ETF. So we may even have that in the future. We've had that consistently in the past. It's currently not in the portfolio at the moment. So that's another important aspect is it's a global developed markets technology sector. So you're looking beyond that. And it's, as I said, 31 names. So within that space, the other aspect of this is the equal weighting, which is really important. So with our future present range is what we call it. And that's where our tech and our FANG ETF sits alongside the, the Robo ETF, ACDC and our biotech ETF Cure. They're all equally weighted. And that's important because we as a provider or from an index manager's perspective have realized that you don't, we don't want investors, we don't know the winner or loser. And we don't also want to pick the biggest company by size and just have them being the highest weighting. Because you, what you then find is a bit of a momentum trap. You know, as the companies do well, the size basically keeps driving their weight in the portfolio. So for these thematics and sectors, what we wanted to do is equally weight those portfolios. And so for all of our five ETFs in some way, they've got an equal weight methodology. And that's the same process here with this particular ETF. It has an equal weight methodology. And that means that you've balanced out and diversified across those 31 names. And you may have an ETF, a stock within that that does very well, which is positive because then it provides a positive performance, but then you've protected yourself. You don't have the larger stock that potentially can be quite volatile that drives the performance of the ETF. Yeah, so the way I see this being used is very much across multiple risk profiles because we talk about technology. Again, technology shouldn't be seen as just a pure growth play. They're investing for the future, but a lot of these names, you know, in a way technology as a sector is, is quite industrial now. You know, as we talked about it earlier, it, it, you could say, is technology, should it be seen in, in that industrial view? We need it, we use it. And these are the names that are really the best quality, the best value from that perspective. So what we find is the tech ETF and the tech, as a sector exposure being used across different risk profiles, no longer just for growth and high growth investors. It is a tactical satellite com, um, tilt. So where they may have their broad market exposure, their broad exposure to, you know, a core allocation, this is a satellite to provide that sector play. And that's how we see it being used. But as I said, we see it being used now, not only just in the growth and high growth, but across the different risk profiles. Mm, okay, great. Um, Kanish, that takes us through the three ETFs. Thanks for taking the time to join me on the program today, mate. No, thanks for having me on.